for this. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to introduce this situation again and again. I'm always here again. I'd like to thank our colleagues and our colleagues to invite me to this occasion. So the uh, topic which I'd like to uh, contribute in this cultural uh, uh, workshop is a deep learning. So uh, I started uh, learning deep learning uh, two years ago. I'm still learning deep learning. But uh, so I so uh, first I'd like to tell you why I started uh, learning deep learning. I thought that uh, it would be interesting to see uh, whether this deep learning may uh, help my research or not in some way. And in fact, uh, it, it was a fun to. Uh, find a nice uh, gravity dual of uh, QCG data uh, through the ASAP correspondence. So I'd like to report on that uh, in this talk. So this talk is based on a collaboration with uh, Sugishita kun at, at Kentucky, and Tanaka kun and Tomia kun at Britain, and also uh, my students at Sada and Sumi at the Oscar University. And uh, we are going to put our paper soon. So before getting into the details, uh, I'd like to advertise one uh, workshop at the UCAL Institute, which is coming at the end of uh, October. So we put uh, people from finance model and data sciences uh, to our workshop, uh, which will be held uh, uh, starting uh, from 31st of October for three days. So if you're interested in deep learning and physics, then please uh, find the webpage, DLAP 2019, and please come. Okay, so I divided my talk into three parts. The first is, uh, well, it, it was a question to myself, is deep learning useful for uh, any student or not? So uh, my answer is uh, kind of negative. Yeah, it's interesting to see how they are related uh, somehow. However, uh, yeah, so, uh, so far, I don't know whether it's uh, really useful or not. But uh, this, this is uh, to, to work. Uh, in section two and three uh, about uh, the use of deep learning to get uh, low geometry from QCT data. So first, I, I'd like to discuss uh, that is QCT data or QCT file condensate. And then second, uh, this is uh, still unpublished, but that is a QCT hardware spectrum. We will see some uh, coincident coin, kind of uh, emergence of the for here. Okay. So in section one, I'd like to include some review of uh, deep learning. So if you have any questions, then just please ask me. So why I thought that deep learning may be useful for uh, string theory research is uh, so basically these three reasons. At first, uh, as I will explain, uh, holographic QCD is an uh, inverse program. So what is inverse? So inverse program is uh, supposed to be uh, well treated by deep learning. So uh, suppose we have uh, this uh, equation, A is equal to F equal B. The normal program means that uh, system F, is, uh, something like the equation of motion, this is given. Then the question is, uh, for given B, is calculated A. So it's a normal program. So it goes for C and four. However, uh, one version of inverse program is that uh, for given many data set of A and B, find the system F. So system F may have many, many parameters. So it uh, basically is very difficult to determine. So you put uh, uh, in physics uh, some physical principles or something to uh, restrict the system F so that you can find the equation of motion. So uh, program QCD is an inverse program, so maybe uh, deep learning will be useful. The second, uh, if I look at the uh, history of uh, gravity in discrete space time, then uh, gravity, if you want to discretize a space time, then it is a network. So whatever it is. Uh, generated form. So uh, it's a network optimization by Einstein action. And so uh, it's a deep, uh, deep learning is a kind of uh, inventing a new network architecture and of how to optimize it. And thirdly, the deep learning, some of the deep learning architecture actually looks like a holography. And holography is an uh, interesting way to look at gravity. So uh, this may help us. So I'll go uh, from one to three. So first, uh, why I say the program QCD is an inverse program? 
Um, so uh, there are uh, many uh, very uh, interesting holographic QCD model, uh, which is basically a five-dimensional gravity model which can reproduce uh, QCD uh, observable data uh, using very cl classical equation of the five dimensions. So how this uh, bottom-up approach of holographic QCD is given is as follows. First, you invent some gravity model in five dimensions with uh, some metric G in you. Then uh, you use this model and solve the equation of motion for this model to, uh, to compute the prediction. Prediction means that uh, it is, uh, for example, a condensate, iron spectrum, and uh, for, this, uh, for these arrows, you use uh, ADSC prediction. So you replace uh, some part of uh, this asymptotic information of the fields uh, into the solution of equation of motion to uh, uh, QC example. And then you compare that with, for example, some hard on experimental data or lattice QCD data, and, blah, blah. and if you find that uh, these, uh, uh, coi co these coincide with each other, then you say that this gravity model is very good. So this is a phenomenological and effective uh, approach for QCD. So it's not based on string theory. It's just a bottom-up approach, and it's effective. Uh, but uh, if, one, if one finds a nice uh, gravity, gravity model, gravity model, then uh, it would be uh, uh, suggest some new aspects of QC. That's a whole, and uh, that's an interesting part of program in QC. But the issue of program here is that, uh, so it's always the uh, point that you have to come up with a nice model, and then compute, and finally you compare these things, and uh, if they don't match, then you throw away. So it's a trial and error approach. However, if you can do uh, backwards like this, starting from some experimental data and fix, for example, the background a metric of this five-dimensional model, then uh, you can actually make sure that uh, this model coincides with this experimental data. But uh, you have to go backwards with this. So this is system uh, determination program uh, for which uh, deep learning is supposed to be good at. So uh, in my uh, section two, I use a chiral condensate data, and then it fixes uh, some, a certain metric which reproduces this experimental data. And then I use ADSC prediction to predict or uh, compute uh, other observables, uh, which is uh, QQ bar potential, and then compare that with other lattice uh, QCD data. Uh, uh, so this, so uh, this is a, a program which I uh, came up with, and, uh, and then uh, you see how uh, whether it's a nice one. Second point of which I uh, made is that uh, discrete gravity uh, could be a kind of network of optimization. And deep learning is about network optimization, so uh, there uh, could be some nice relation, I hope. But indeed, uh, they, uh, they are actually very different. For example, this very progress, the famous space progress of this United space time, uh, this uh, is supposed to be a, a common gravity. But uh, what we do in uh, deep learning is very different from this. It's rather close to uh, these things, uh, where uh, background is almost fixed, and in that fixed background, you compute some uh, fluctuating uh, quantum fields. So uh, deep learning is not really quantum gravity. However, uh, so uh, in a broad sense, this is a network optimization, so maybe it's uh, to see some possible. So let me uh, give you a brief review of uh, uh, machine learning uh, by maybe three or four pages uh, for those who are not familiar with this concept. So what is machine learning? <coughs> so it's, uh, the easiest way to explain machine learning is it's just optimizing networks. And if you Google uh, neural networks, then this is a good uh, net neural network too. So people invented many, many uh, kinds of neural networks. And this is not uh, just, so it's uh, just a, a, a part of the, the whole uh, schematic tool of uh, neural networks. Uh, these neural networks were invented uh, such that uh, it suffices uh, some purpose. So we want to train the system so that, uh, for example, image recognition, uh, classification program, so program, there are many problems. And depending on what kind of program you want to solve as a neural program, uh, people invented many kinds. The point is that uh, for each uh, diagram, which is shown here, so these are neural networks, 
uh, they are talking about the function, the function axis. So let me explain what, uh, for example, this one means. Machine learning is a function approximator. So uh, when uh, people write this kind of diagram, then this means a function constant. Uh, the input is a vector. Uh, for example, in this case, this yellow one is an input, so it's a two-dimensional vector. It's an input, v1, so v1, v2. And then output uh, is this red circle. And for, for this uh, graph, the output is just one. <coughs> so it means that some uh, real value will be an output. So uh, in this case, the function is f of v1 and v2, v2. And this one is called percept from all. And of course, I can generalize this to make it longer and longer. And uh, that longer one is called the deep uh, perceptron model. So deep neural network means that uh, this, uh, so that we, we call these uh, layers. And if you have many, many layers, then it's called the deep uh, neural network. And as I, uh, so I'll explain what uh, this means in detail later. But the point is that uh, there is a so-called uh, universal approximation theory proven. Any function can be approximated with uh, more hidden units. Hidden units means these green ones. And if you include the number of these uh, green circles, then it is shown that any function can be approximated by these functional answers. Okay. So let me explain what uh, this means. The perceptron model is a function which is written like this. So x is the v, that is the input function. So I have a two-dimensional vector, x1, x2. And f is a final value. So this is the function. And what are those uh, these are uh, w and w and phi? So it's explained here. So first, uh, these circles are called units, and those are vector components. And then second, these lines are uh, called weights. So this is a linear transformation. So for example, uh, so we have two dimensional vector equal to x1, x2, and then you multiply two by two matrix w, and then you get another two dimensional vector. Right? So this uh, multiplication is written by these lines. So there are four components. And these four components are not fixed. So you can uh, uh, so represent uh, arbitrary linear transformation by these uh, components of the uh, elements of the w. And then uh, interesting part is that uh, there is a hidden uh, operation here, uh, which is phi. Uh, phi is called activation function, which is hidden by n. It is a nonlinear component-wise transformation, uh, which is given by this function. So this is a nonlinear function. For, so for example, the first component of this Wx, you want to you add to this phi of x, then you transform that to some uh, output value. And then you use that as an input of the second okay. So in this way, uh, uh, so in this way, uh, non-linearity uh, comes in for the functional answers here. And this uh, activation function normally you fix a, a certain function. And this one is the famous one, which is called sigma function. And people use this, people use this sub fixed function. So in this way, uh, uh, so a certain class of uh, nonlinear function can be represented by this graph. Do you have any question? Okay. So how do we uh, train uh, this perceptron model? So training means that, uh, for example, in the case of image recognition system, uh, you input a uh, cat image or a dog image, then the output is a cat photo. So if cat is zero, a dog is one, then the output value is 0 or 1. And this yellow are circles, but there should be many, many uh, yellow circles uh, so that uh, the image, digital image can be. So the training protocol is as follows. Prepare uh, many sets of uh, this cat and 0, cat and 0, dog, 1, dog, 1. So we prepare many, many sets. So this is a set of the correct input and output. And you train uh, this uh, model such that it reproduces Set the training is by adjusting this weight w or changing this w by lowering so called loss function, which is defined like this. Loss function is the difference between 
uh, this uh, correct output and the machine output. If this uh, uh, difference is zero, then this means that uh, this uh, model uh, can correctly uh, reproduce uh, the answer at a given image x. And there is a way to uh, reduce this loss function uh, by just an op uh, operational procedure. So uh, if you train uh, this uh, W, uh, by training I mean uh, changing this W matrices uh, adequately, then uh, finally you get a nice uh, trained machine which can have a very small value of cost function. Okay. So uh, of course uh, this uh, first from model has very little number of uh, individual freedom, but if you increase, for example, the number of uh, green uh, circles, or if you increase the uh, uh, layers so that it becomes deeper, then it has uh, many more divisor freedom. So uh, it can reproduce space but in principle uh, function. So what's the intuition behind choosing this activation function? Um, yeah, the intuition is that uh, so this function looks like so if x is uh, plus infinity equals to one, but if x is minus infinity equals to zero, so this function looks uh, like this as a function of x, and this mimics uh, our neurons. So if x is negative, the input uh, voltage is negative, then this neuron is not activated, so it will not emit some signal. But if uh, it exceeds some uh, threshold, then the neuron is activated, then it emits some signal. So this nonlinearity is the basics of our brain. So uh, people use uh, this signal force. But uh, later, uh, it was uh, found that if you use this, then the training is very difficult. So they use a uh, different function, which looks like uh, So this is also a nonlinear function, so it suffices. And also, if you take, uh, even if you take a derivative, uh, this is non-zero, but the original one is zero. And uh, this training goes with uh, some derivative function. So it's preferred to use uh, this function, which is called rectangular. But uh, this is actually uh, uh, just your preference. So if the training goes wrong, that means uh, human, human learning cannot beat the uh, machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so the uh, protocol for uh, lowering this error function is uh, very artificial. So it's called back propagation. And uh, we don't know whether our brain actually uses back propagation to train. Okay? So if there is some other mechanism, uh, which may be some statistical average or something, then you know, we can beat the <laughs> okay, so let me go to the third point. Uh, it is if he may look uh, similar to deep uh, learning. The meaning is quite uh, simple. Uh, as I said, the uh, gravity on discretized space time is a network. And ADSCFT is group like this, where uh, so it's supposed to relate the uh, ADS uh, gravity and uh, quantum field theory at the boundary. And quantum field theory at the boundary is, uh, uh, gives you a consistent correlation function, so it's uh, like an input. And then uh, with the deep learning, the deep neural network, you propagate this again. And at the end, if this uh, uh, input uh, satisfies a correct bound function, then you say that it's a correct boundary data. But it, uh, if it doesn't, then it's not the correct boundary. So in gravity, there is a different boundary condition. Uh, here, uh, in the case of thermal ADS-CFT correspondence, uh, you have a graph polarizing here. For well, the zero temperature, uh, all of this uh, fluctuating uh, propagating field needs to be not normalizable, so it should go to zero. So it, there, there is a kind of uh, deep infrared boundary condition here uh, for that, uh, so, so that uh, the field propagating inside of ADS uh, should satisfy. And the boundary condition here, consistency with uh, the uh, uh, function. So in this sense, uh, well, it's very rough picture, 
Bata Ifawi can invent some uh, network which can mimic ADS uh, propagation of a scalar field or vector field in the background of some geometry uh, as a neural network. Then we can see some correspondence between ADS CFT and So, I'm going to talk about section two and three. Uh, in section two, uh, so using this uh, deep perceptron model, uh, I, I want to solve uh, this inverse problem of holographics. And section three is some other, so similar but some other idea which I can Okay, so uh, let me map uh, a scalar uh, field theory in five dimensions uh, in curved space time to a neural network. And the mapping is quite simple. So we just discretize the equation of motion. Since, uh, as I said, the neural network is just a uh, function of ansatz, and you can uh, create it as you like. So uh, discretization of a uh, scalar equation of motion actually has a uh, neural network framework. And uh, one caveat is that, uh, well, to solve this inverse problem, you actually don't need to ask for uh, neural network. It's just an inverse program. So if you have some uh, nice other skin type shooting method or something to solve inverse uh, program, then that's fine. I think it's, it's better. But here, uh, uh, what I wanted to explore is just a comparison between deep learning and of understanding of discrete space time and CFD. So uh, let me continue uh, to get the uh, neural network of the scale. So this one is uh, the typical scale of field theory. Uh, in the plus one dimension in the, in the world. And the curved space time uh, has this form. So I want to do some uh, a black hole situation. So uh, I build the cage, uh, G, A, I, X, C, plus one. And this echo beta and echo beta, these are uh, unknown functions. Since uh, space time is unknown. But uh, the boundary condition is fixed. That A is boundary, A is infinity, F and G goes like exponential function with ADS greater L. And on the other hand, at the black hole horizon, theta equals to zero. Uh, F, the temporal component, should be made by theta squared. And G needs to be a non-zero constant. So these are the conditions uh, for which F and G is satisfied. But otherwise, F and G are free. And then uh, we solve the equation motion for phi. And then we can get a uh, response function of C. So uh, we use the dictionary of ADSUFD by Prevalon van Witten here. So uh, how about the So here are boundary conditions for this uh, scalar field phi. Uh, at ADS boundary, theta is infinite. So if you use this form, then you can solve equation motion with a very weak uh, potential term. We have uh, two bonds. One is this, and the other is this. The other plus, the other minus are called the conformal dimension of the operator. CFT, which corresponds to this phi. So, and one is a normalizable form, the other is non normalizable form. And in fact, the, the uh, response, a one point function in CFT in the background of J, the expectation value of O in the background of uh, the source J, is given by uh, this equation. J comes in the coefficient of non normalizable form, O comes as a coefficient of normalizable so this is the recipe uh, given by the program. On the other hand, there is a black hole boundary condition at theta equal to zero. Uh, this phi needs to satisfy the inborn boundary condition into the black hole. And since I'm uh, working with the uh, static configuration of phi, the inborn boundary condition just says this. So when you impose this, in fact, uh, uh, this O and J needs to be related. This is second order dependent. So if you impose two boundary conditions, then uh, you fix uh, j as a function, so o as a function of j. So once you get the relation between o and j, then it gives you a response function with c of t. So this is the recipe of the one one. Now, so let's look at the scalar equation a little bit more detail. So this one is scalar equation of motion. 
Um, the metric was arbitrary, but uh, the metric function uh, appears here as a function. It's a data dependent function. And H is defined like this. So F and G are these are components of the metric. And I define this function and take it H and it appears here. So only this combination appears in scalar equation. And now, since this is second order differential equation, I discretize it. Uh, so I go to a Hamilton form, a Hamilton equation, and then discretize uh, along either direction. And I got uh, this set of equations. The first one is uh, saying just saying that pi is a conjugate of uh, phi. So phi dot is equal to phi. And the second one is a replacement of uh, this equation. And now, since this uh, equation looks uh, as an evolution equation of, uh, of phi and pi, so for uh, if uh, you have the information of pi and pi at theta, then you, you can get the information of pi and pi at theta plus theta. And once you get this form, then normally for uh, almost all kinds of equation of motion can be mapped to your network. So here is the idea of pi of pi. So you have the initial function here. And then using this equation backwards, you can solve it like this, like this. And so uh, this is a neural network representation. And the green line here is the uh, training weights. The reason is that uh, this equation, uh, what is arbitrary is just this function h and the potential function b. So these are unknown. So uh, unknown coefficients are appearing in uh, here and here. Okay. And in particular, this h is uh, a coefficient from pi of beta to pi of beta plus delta beta. So uh, it's from here to here. The other weights are completely fixed by one or zero or something. But this green one uh, is an arbitrary function h of beta. So uh, in this neural network, uh, the previous perceptual model uh, shows that uh, every weights are arbitrary. But here, uh, to have a space time depression motion interpretation, you regard only these three lines as your training weights, and the others are completely fixed. In that uh, very sparse neural network, uh, you have depression of motion interpretation. So this is just a replacement of uh, scalar equation to the uh, neural network language. So, so B is also um, yeah, so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, assuming that B is equal to, for example, uh, coefficient times uh, 5 to the fourth. So this is 5 fourth scale of field field. But uh, this lambda is unknown. So lambda is like uh, this uh, background metric. So I want to actually derive the five dimensional system. But uh, if you allow under functional form for B, then uh, yeah, it's difficult to map network, so I assume this form. Oh, of course, you can add some other. And this one is, uh, uh, gives you a non-linearity in this uh, Hamiltonian equation. So it's like an activation function. So uh, originally, people took uh, this uh, fixed uh, activation function. But here, if you want to actually uh, train this, this coefficient in uh, potential, then activation function itself uh, needs to be trained. If, if you didn't assume the fixed weights, mm -hmm. would you be able to discover them? So that could you discover the equations of motion from the data? Oh, I see. Uh, actually, I tried to. Yeah, so it's easy to make these things up. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, the result is that every time you train the system, the result are different. Yeah. So I get some statistical yeah, uh, results, collection of results, uh, some of which may look better like this, but some of them uh, doesn't look so good. Yeah. So uh, to find a nice interpretation, physical interpretation, uh, we, we need to actually restrict the neural network quite much. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, so I'm training with this system, but uh, even with this system, uh, you can find many different answers. 
So what I do is that uh, if I uh, want to have a, a space-time interpretation for this H, then H needs to be a smooth function. So if I so I, I impose some condition that H needs to be smooth. Otherwise, it means a completely zigzag uh, space-time. It doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, the summary here uh, for the correspondence looks like this. The uh, emergent space direction, so for emergent space direction theta in NSFD is the depth of latency. Gravity metric, a part of a combination of gravity metric components, is mapped to neural network weights, but in a very sparse way. Nonlinear response in CFD maps to the input theta, and the uh, horizon condition is the output theta. And the interaction term in the ball is the activation So this easy uh, identification actually allows me to train this system for a given response function to get uh, interaction as well as possible. So this uh, inverse uh, kind of shooting method is used uh, to uh, apply to this system. So let me uh, start with the QCD higher compensating data uh, and input. Then fix this. So first, I need to uh, determine what is the uh, positive and negative data. Uh, uh, this one is a lattice QCD data for chiral condensate. The value versus the fog mass. So if you change fog mass, then uh, chiral condensate changes. The chiral condensate operator is uh, what I call O. So it's an operator O composite operator, and its source is actually fog mass. J. So J, uh, O as a function of J, is given by QCD, like this, and by QCD, like this. And uh, I want to fix the metric. And uh, for, for definite metric, uh, there is a certain temperature. And uh, this is many lines uh, uh, for different temperatures. So I just pick up one temperature like okay, this. So this is a graph one, uh, which is uh, which corresponds to 196 degrees. So it's around the uh, confinement to confinement transition temperature. And I picked up this one. And then I generated uh, positive data and negative. Positive data means that uh, this is uh, the correct safety data. And negative data means that it's not the PCD. And I assign this for 0 and this for 1 as an output. So that really makes sense. And the width actually is given by so there is no error bar here, but there, there, there actually is this error bar. There is a systematic error in the CD. So using that, uh, you can determine the error bar. So here, the input is only four points. It's only four points. So we assume that it's smooth, and we interpret it now. And I use the data to So it's always the case that that CD has very little so uh, it has that, so it could be zigzag. Yeah, you don't assume that. So it's coming just from four data points. And then uh, uh, this current uh, uh, condensate as a function of both uh, mass can be mapped to the value of this asymptotic uh, value of phi by the value of so the normalizable, not normalizable coefficients, and both mass and uh, condensate. And uh, for the uh, special case of uh, conformal, in integer conformal dimension, uh, you need to be careful about the interaction term and the was pointed out by some people. So uh, actually, there is a correction. But anyway, uh, this is a map from QCD data to the asymptotic value of phi and pi. The component dimension of Q bar Q is the mass dimension, that is 3. And uh, uh, everything is measured in the unit of ADS radius. But ADS radius is, again, unknown. It's a parameter in the model. So I need to train ADS radius. So the final form of uh, neural network is this. So by pi input, to get these things, I have to map the QCD data by using this equation. And then propagation in the ball and 
finally, uh, horizon conditions uh, So the training uh, protocol is for unspecified metric this weight and coupling concept, which is the activation function, and also it is. So I uh, plug in the QCD lattice data here, and then do the training. And the result of the training looks like this. So first, the, uh, this is the initial condition for the neural network. So uh, here, uh, so this is H, function H, and this is the layer. And the initial value of this metric is zig zigzag. So this is randomly generated. And I use uh, this as an initial condition. And anytime you train the system, you change the initial condition. And then uh, on the other left, uh, this is a figure for uh, QQ bar where uh, condensate as a function of four points. And this uh, uh, dense bar is the uh, positive data. But uh, you can see that uh, all are green. So green means that with this uh, metric con uh, configuration, the data which are judged as positive is plotted as so this is very bad. So this metric configuration is bad. So uh, from now, uh, we tune uh, this metric configuration by neural network uh, so that uh, these green ones actually coincide with the uh, positive And here is the movie for the training. Uh, 10 to 20 minutes to find uh, this uh, distribution with uh, some smooth function uh, by my cut. So it's easy to implement, and uh, finally, they, uh, this machine get uh, some distribution like this. So they, have, they try to match uh, this with the positive data, but uh, there are some places where the discrepancy is. However, I think that uh, this would be due to our uh, too much restriction of the potential function. So in the end, of course, if you allow arbitrary function for the potential, then uh, this machine can uh, do better. So anyway, the trained value of uh, ADS radius is found to be this value, 100 plus 37 MV, which is close to the uh, QCD. And then uh, the scalar uh, self coupling lambda, the function was pi 4, is found to be very small and positive. And yeah, that is consistent with the uh, variety of the model. Excuse me, sir. We've given different initial condition. Yes. They come to the same? Yeah, it's all the same. same. Yeah, so I'll show, so uh, I think I don't show you the statistical data of the result of metric, but uh, the windows looks like something. So it always go, so it all goes down. And then it goes so, it, so it's okay for metric function to be not one of the It's not okay. <laughs> it's not okay. So here, around here, uh, ADS bound. Uh, around here, black hole horizon bound. So these behaviors are fixed, but the in between it's arbitrary. So, so if you assume Einstein action, then this one doesn't happen. So, uh, so I don't uh, put any constraint other than this function. And, yeah. So uh, this is a function for uh, so for h as a function of eta. So from this, I can get a uh, 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 volume factor. So this, this is h, which is a derivative of volume factor. So I integrate this function to get the volume factor. The volume factor looks like this. The function of eta. So here there is a black hole horizon, so it goes to zero. And here it diverges uh, as an exponential, this is ADS. And in between, it does not go smoothly to zero. It has a bound. If I assume ADS shall shine black hole, then it smoothly goes to zero. So there is a bound structure which was found by this machine. And this bound is not uh, given by Einstein. So there should be some correction to the Einstein equation by the highest solution number or whatever, I, I don't know. And that gives you this bound. Oh. 
And uh, there are some arguments on uh, what kind of work could be possible by correcting Einstein equations. One is by quantum gravity, higher coverage term. Uh, okay. And there are other works. Like uh, if you put uh, some other uh, contribution team in, then you, of course you can create some, something straight in the So anyway, uh, using this. So uh, yeah, I looked at the literature. And then, uh, in fact, uh, there is a, a bottom-up model which kind of uh, predicted uh, this one. So Andre and Zakharov in 2007, they invented this uh, phenomenological metric. It's not the solution of equation motion, but they just invented this. And it looks very much uh, like ours. The reason why they invented this is that uh, because, so, so this is a bar, and this looks like a company. The confinement is that uh, in the hardware or software model, it goes up. Yes. So this is a coexistence of uh, the confinement and the confinement. So they wanted to reproduce uh, some property of the uh, MC equal to 3 QCD. So they uh, came up with this metric and our symmetry uh, kind of thing. And in fact, uh, if you compute the QQ potential by uh, based on our Zina, we have this protocol the number of actions is metric. Then uh, the result is like this. So there is a linear potential part in addition to the device screen part. And this is uh, actually uh, what Andre and Zafar wanted to have. And if you compare that with the uh, status QCD data, uh, which, as you may know, there is a device screen part in addition to the combined uh, potential part. So if there is no bound, then there is no combined part. It just goes to from chromic phase to device two. So the presence of this uh, is, um, I think, uh, it's a con nice consistency check of this uh, emergent model. How many minutes? Seven. 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 <laughs> it's a so finally, I've explained uh, this is the Hadron spectra, uh, which are published, but uh, maybe uh, some of you may have fun. So, uh, so this is one page review of what uh, uh, Karch, Katzson, and Stefan made in the very famous software model. So it's a review. So they started with the gate, a classical gauge theory, U1 gauge theory, but the uh, IP Dilaton gravity background. Phi and uh, phi is a Dilaton metric is this. And met, so this is zero temperature. So uh, your temperature metric is in like this, this uh, scale one. Okay, okay. So there are unknown two functions, phi and k. And if you want to impose uh, ADS CFT dictionary at uh, the boundary, then around ADS bound is equal to zero. This combination phi minus k should be paid as a log z. If you uh, uh, substitute this, I'm sorry, I think I, I, think I missed factor two here. <coughs> So if you substitute this here, then this becomes one with this square. So it's very easy. And then what uh, they did is uh, they solve the equation of motion for gauge field by decomposing that to uh, a function of z and function of other three corresponding field. And this becomes a row uh, row mesom. Row mesom. The equation uh, for this b is uh, derived this, where omega squared is uh, the, the mass of this chromosome. And when this omega squared uh, takes a proper discrete value, omega squared, <laughs> then this Vn becomes normalizable. And you can have an interpretation of the excitation. So uh, the, uh, the equation which you have to solve is this. For, uh, so for some uh, value of this omega squared, uh, Vn becomes normalizable. And now, uh, you do the same. This is about equation motion. So you go to Hamilton configuration, and this it, like this, as before. Then you, are, you have a neural network representation. So now, the input is not only pi and p. So pi is the conjugate of p. In addition to that, you have uh, omega squared. This is uh, the mass of the omega and this becomes the input. So once you have correct the value of uh, mass for the omega then finally, it satisfies the normalizability. So in this way, input and output are fixed, 
and you can do a supervised training. So for example, I took a PTG data for Romans and Mass. The first excitation is this, the second one is this. So this is a mass around Q positive data, and the other is negative data. And using this, uh, you train the system, and the result is this. So B uh, appearing in the equation motion, which is a metric, so what would you say it's a Dilaton minus metric, uh, is trained like this. <coughs> it has an ABS behavior around here, but uh, this one uh, is uh, emergent. Only with this, unfortunately, uh, a combination phi minus a is still but independent uh, phi and a uh, cannot be uh, given. So uh, you can actually do the, a similar thing for uh, a two method, which is speed two vector method. This and use use a similar protocol, then you can fix phi minus three a like this. And then uh, yeah, comparing these two, you can uh, independently. And in particular, A gives you the metric function. And this is the exponential of 2A that is scale factor. And you have uh, this uh, result. And here, uh, ADS uh, behavior is seen, but there is a bump structure. Pure ADS looks like this, but there is a bump. So again, uh, somehow, I don't know why, but I combine with geometry inverse, and it's consistent <coughs> with that. So this is the end of my story. Thank you for your attention. I have gone through all these things. And then uh, I, I have some more uh, discussion about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions? So if you have to uh, have the value of beta go from 0 to 1, <coughs> choose a large But uh, for the given uh, video of uh, training, I could do only a uh, very short range of data. Of course, you cannot go to data. So it's like until 10 or something. Yeah, but uh, it depends on whether you trust this result. So I, I didn't actually do it. So, so why you impose like, a symbolic against part of the community? I think you should express something different than that, right? Um, you are right. Uh, but uh, so uh, in any safety, if you want to have a different relation between the operator uh, conformal dimension and the mass of the ball, then you have to assume that the uh, symbolic against is. So I just relied on that. The, so I think it's very quickly go to uh, become a little bit different in size, right? But you, I re recall, I, I noticed that the bump over here, I am. So uh -huh. that's a little bit interesting. I see, I see. Yeah, if I can improve this uh, with some other boundary conditions, then that would be. In the top down approaches, of course, that they are not a conformal. But uh, I think most of the bottom up approach models are based on ADS boundary. But they they have put some potential. Sure, sure. Potential in that tree. Other questions? Yes. Uh presumably uh find out there another way to uh, arrive at the the answer to the metric there they get. Can you compare the efficiency of the network with your net uh with machine learning? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I asked uh, Andre uh, what, why they got like this. And then they said that, that they wanted to uh, have this. Yes, of course. So they, they, they came backwards. So uh, so they wanted to have uh, this part and this part at the same time. So that part, they took the metric function. But uh, our case is that, that this. Uh, our function was uh, coming from uh, chiral quantity. So normally it's different from 
who find it different from it's kind of kind of behavior, kind of symmetry. <coughs> so it's nice that uh, there is an interplay between kind of symmetry breaking and confinement confinement. People discussing the relation uh, for long years. And so uh, here within this model, uh, we can say that kind of symmetry breaking is intrinsically related to confinement. No, I mean uh, the way you did it is very nice. Presumably we can now just uh, get the data and then get the machine to job and then we arrive at this. Uh, but uh, about the bottom-up approach, what in what what kind of uh, uh, methodology do they use to get those uh, metrics? To to get this one? Yeah. This so is it, it's just function. pure pure guess or it's a yeah. guess. It's a guess. It's so guess. Uh, this part is edit function, and this part uh, they add it. Mm -hmm. and just that. Yeah. So they tune this coefficient c to move uh, this uh, function. That's it. That part can give you the linear potential at four parts. No, I, I understand the, yeah. the way they did it. I just want to compare. Yeah, they because I, naturally you want to know how, how what do you gain from using the machine learning. In the end, you get a nice result. But I think the machine learning gives you some way you can just once you program it, then you can go for a lot of data and then you get a, yeah. without thinking. So, so at, at this stage, I, I don't say that the machine can perform them. Find you since it was already discovered and discussed. Well, it's still a little bit different. You see that the way they come to the path. This one is called down here. Yeah, that one is uh, exponential yeah, to zero. So yeah. But, but as you know, so this is uh, based on this uh, just one right. condition. Right. And this, I, I just increased the number of conditions. Right. So, um, yeah, so I think it's just uh, uh, this. But I was amazed that uh, this, I didn't know this paper. And I'm very desperate. Okay, let's thank Coach.